Good afternoon, uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Africa, and uh, good morning, colleagues uh, from North America, and good afternoon or good morning, other colleagues uh, from wherever you are. My name is uh, Richard Mkandawiri. I'm the Africa Director for the Alliance for African Partnership, uh, based in Malawi, but uh, working with uh, Michigan State University. Uh, on behalf of the Alliance for African Partnership, including partner, partners from uh, the University of Leeds, Sterling University, uh, Michigan State University, the University of Pretoria, Makerere University, uh, Lilongo University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, the University of Malawi, and um, other partners I would like to welcome you to this dialogue on multidimensional impact of environmental change in the African Great Lakes. The Alliance for African Partnership is uh, committed uh, to building mutually beneficial partnerships between uh, Africa and North, uh, Global North and Northern institutions. We're committed to uh, the co-creation of initiatives that impact on lives uh, on the ground. We're also committed to anchoring our research in Pan-African development processes and building and strengthening African institutional capacities more particularly uh, in the R&D systems, including uh, outreach work. Uh, the aim of this dialogue is not only about sharing interdisciplinary thinking in addressing problems of fisheries science across the Great Lakes region, but also enhancing research capacity and uh, generating public goods for the peoples and uh, the governments of the uh, region and indeed across Africa. From AP, therefore, uh, we do not see this uh, dialogue as a one-shot activity, but rather we see it as a launchpad for the creation of a platform for the coalition uh, of the willing that are committed to driving impactful research that leads towards uh, transforming lives of the peoples of Africa. And in this particular case, for the African Great Lakes region. Our expectation, therefore, is that uh, there will be continuity of our conversations on how based uh, we might build uh, a very strong alliance and a coalition of the willing that uh, will continuously uh, engage on uh, this extremely critical subject. Uh, without further ado, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, allow me uh, to introduce our keynote uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Emmanuel Kaunda. Uh, he is the Vice Chancellor uh, of uh, the University of Lilongwe of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Uh, professor Kaunda is a fisheries science, uh, science a professor in fisheries science with over 30 years research in teaching fisheries ecology, fish trade, fisheries policy, outreach, and development uh, in Africa. Among the honors he has received include uh, Aquaculturist of the Year by the Aquaculture Association of uh, Southern Africa. Uh, he currently serves uh, on the board of uh, Africa Center for Aquatic Research Education. He is the current president of Pan-African Fish and Fisheries Association. He is past Robin Welcome Fellow at Michigan State University. Uh, so without further ado, uh, allow me to call upon Professor Emmanuel Kawunda uh, to give us the keynote address. Professor Kawunda. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard Nkandawire. My title this afternoon here in Malawi, I think uh, elsewhere, it's perhaps in the morning, uh, is dealing with uh, wicked problems uh, in the African back legs. And I've called these wicked problems after uh, a statement which I'm quoting the next slide, uh, you can get to it. Uh, uh, Lundis uh, Lucinda just wrote uh, shoo, 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 uh, last month or so, today's grand challenges associated with society at large and large lakes in particular are easily described as wicked problems. And these are, as Steve Shimda states, that have no recipe or set of protocols you can use to solve them. And he's citing climate change 
and biodiversity loss as two examples that meet the classic definition of wicked problems. But as you see, for the African Great Lakes, it's actually more than climate change, more than biodiversity losses, which can be described and fit into this definition. In the next slide, uh, which I'm showing, is that uh, I'm trying to show in this, that with the multidimensional challenges that African Great Lakes face, there are multifaceted efforts by different groups uh, in these institutions working together, providing to provide solutions. But somehow, these wicked problems keep undermining the efforts. And my question, which I want us to interrogate uh, in this session today is why? Why are these wicked problems still undermining the efforts despite the intensive research, uh, intensive goodwill, intensive policy dialogue that is happening? In the next slide, I'm showing that uh, the African Great Lakes, which you can see to the right, uh, is about eight lakes there. Uh, they, provide, they are about 25% of the whole world and frozen fresh water but also they provide services to 62 million uh, in terms of food, water, livelihood support, and also sustainable use of these resources. But my argument also is that it's beyond 62 million. It's not 62 million because the fish that is coming from these Great Lakes is not surrounding these lakes, but it is all over. And this is shown in the next slide. Uh, this next slide is showing this uh, what we did in a study with African Union uh, on how the fish from our Great Lakes uh, is going all over. So you can see from Lake Victoria, all these more fishes. So it's all over the whole of this Africa. So it's not just 62 million, it's small and more. And these are very important resources driving our economy. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I'm, I'm trying to show uh, that these wicked problems are grilling uh, and happening before our eyes. And if in fact, ch giving challenges to our fisheries resources, uh, even in our own time, lifetime. And, and I'm giving just a case study of Malawi fisheries, just to exemplify the key challenges and the huge challenges we have these our resources. So in the next slide, you see a descending graph of the large scale commercial fisheries in catches. If you look at that graph, uh, you were talking about uh, 1976. 1976, I was already in secondary school, or I was already, yes, or, or in primary school, I was already old. But you can see where this graph is showing and what is the next, what is going to happen next if these wicked problems are not tackled and we cannot pay a lot more attention. And this is very serious. In the next slide, I'm showing, uh, the, again, the trains in, in the few species if you look at the red bland, this is just our sour kambuzi. But, and, and the green one is the chambo. Chambo, those people have come to Malawi, is a delicacy, it's a known species. But look at the population now. The green is almost disappeared completely from our waters. And this is a, a big thing for Malawi. The result of this, the result which we are seeing here is reality on the ground. So look at the next slide, just to, sh to give you uh, what is going on. This came out on your, in our times, uh, in, our, in our news, in our, one of our uh, tweets, but it, this has happened. And it says, the journal manager confirmed the development, further referring that in the past four years, the company has reduced its workforce from 2030 to 94 people in order to survive the prevailing business function. This is the only company, a big company in Malawi that has been on fishing. And we're still talking now, they, I think they have left off the fishing and all the, some of the boats are there. It's no longer sustainable. It's no longer economical to go out to fishing. Why? Because the resources are going at a very, very fast route. The wicked problems are with us. We need to deal with them. We need to have a sausage. We need to talk with them with a much more vigor way uh, so that we can save what is going on. This is just uh, to do with uh, uh, labor, but uh, you can see people who are suffering uh, the workforce there. The next slide, um, I wanted to show that these societal challenges, they are not just these wicked problems, just those climate changes, but they are even compounded uh, uh, with uh, the even the pandemics. 
So, so we're talking about gender issues in fisheries. So I give you just an example of the work we've been doing last year with wild fish. Uh, and, and this is in Lake Chirwa, just next slide. Um, uh, the next slide, you see this fish pond. The, the, uh, uh, at the end, if you can read up there, we are seeing the issues which are affected, power relations. And what happened here, this was a cross-border trade. Uh, the, the fishermen from Malawi uh, usually go to Mozambique along this, uh, 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 along this lake. But what we saw in that study is that because there was a uh, uh, loss of control of incomes uh, from the fish trade and the women, uh, the husbands were actually sending women to cross the border during the COVID uh, lockdown because they had at least an opportunity to cross the borders because they were women. The men were beaten severely. So the women were going there. But what happened? They go there, they get raped, they come back, the, the families are gone. The income they get is all taken by the men. So all I'm saying is, apart from these wicked problems we're seeing, the pandemics also in this region, the, the, the natural disasters, they're actually affecting uh, a lot of our pressures on our fisheries and on our women. Because, just move on, uh, because of time, I'm going to jump uh, the biodiversity loss on VST species where somebody's talking about them. So just jump to the next slide. I'll go to the next slide. Let's, ju let's jump them. Uh, this is to do with environmental issues and where they are. Uh, the Lake Victoria issue, most people are aware of it. So let's jump it. I want just to go straight uh, to, um, uh, to go down these examples on Lake Malawi on what biodiversity is. But what I'm sharing now is that with all these wicked problems, um, the African Great Lakes have human potential which needs to be tapped. So what do we have on the ground? And I thought this can also bring in our ideas so that we know what is going on. Within uh, the African um, uh, uh, center, this, uh, the center, the uh, Ekea, we, this is the Ekea, we actually found that in fact, there are 75 academic institutions that are offering degrees uh, within these Great Lakes. And all these have got different programs to do with emergency and disaster management, environmental management. These are PhDs, masters, uh, environmental and degradation, environmental economics, environmental information system, international development, fisheries, aquaculture, all those 75 of them. So they are there, but somehow we are seeing that the situation in our region is getting worse and worse. It's getting dimmer and dimmer. Perhaps there is need uh, for these to work together. Go ahead. Next slide. Yeah, so it seems to me that lack of regional interdisciplinary and focused capacity building perhaps threaten the progress uh, to deal with these wicked programs, wicked challenges. Uh, go ahead. The other regional organizations uh, like Lake Tanganyika uh, Authority, Burundi, um, Lake Tanganyika Authority, which is covering Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, and Zambia. Uh, the other one is Lake Victoria. And some of these were formed some time back, like Lake Victoria Fishers Organization, uh, 1996, Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania, etc. But now only the challenge is that why we have got these regional organizations like these, which are at government level, uh, some of the African Great Lakes uh, don't have these uh, innovative uh, transboundary uh, uh, bodies like Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, and so forth. So that's a big also challenge that we have, why we have this initiative. Can you move on? Next slide. Yeah, so this I give an example of the African Center for Aquatic Research and Education, ACARE, uh, as one of the initiatives that is going on. And I think we should take a, a, a hold and my colleagues, some of my colleagues here, they are in, in part of this uh, initiative, but it's a gro global partnership to leverage that is combined asset technologies, resource of public, private, and profit entities to deliver su sustainable uh, instruments uh, and well as, as research to positively influence policy and management freshwater resources uh, using sound science. So this is also an opportunity uh, of certain organizations on the ground that as we should work with so that we can leverage from what is going on. The next slide. Yeah, this is uh, 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 what I wanted to show here is that, for the example, AK has uh, facilitated the creation of advisory groups along all these eight legs. And, and these are scientific, experts that are coming together as advisory group into this. And another thing that it has done is to create what we call Afghan Women in Science, AWIS program, 
which has trained young women uh, in these scientific freshwaters and, we, and building up, and then they become part of these working groups. LMNBF is actually Lake Malawi, Nyasa, uh, uh, Nyasa uh, uh, Basin uh, Fisheries uh, Network and Aquaculture Network. So it is one of the uh, networks that is facilitated by the AKR. What I'm showing here is that the initiatives, uh, uh, people are worried about this, are trying to come together so we can build up effort to actually reverse the declining trend uh, of, of our fisheries stock and our environment. Next. Next slide. Yeah, so finally, the efforts in sustainable management of resources uh, of AGR uh, should look into mat these multidimensional issues. For example, introduction of new invasive species, the persistent use of conflict due to increase of the demands of the lake's resources, the issue of overfishing. These are also wicked problems in addition to just the loss of biodiversity. Agriculture activities, deforestation, increased nutrient imprint from agriculture, and on increased threats of toxic pollution from industrial waste, and climate change effects a thermal stability of the lakes as some of the key things that we must interrogate uh, on these African Great Lakes. Uh, move on, uh, next slide. Yeah, so and possible gaps and constraints that I, I see, uh, lack of national capacity and adequate lake and instrument framework, particularly in the case of invasive species in some countries, weak coordination among regional sectoral institutions. Um, uh, so how can we work together as this institution we're working together? Lack of coordination even among institutions of higher learning, like I've already expressed, lack of systematic cooperation between neighboring countries in some countries, like for example, I gave an example of Lake Malawi and a few other lakes as well. Lack of interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches to solving challenges and poor linkage of research and research processes to policy. These are some of the things, possible gaps, which I see that as this dialogue is, in, is, is, is developing, we should look at these uh, dialogues uh, as these uh, particular issues. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, other than the wicked problems, uh, we, we, we need to understand that these wicked problems are multidimensional and therefore require my dimensional approaches. In other words, they have to be interdisciplinary. They have to uh, get different expertise. Private sector has to come in. Government have to come in so that we deal with these uh, wicked problems. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Richard Nkandawire, and thank you for attention, uh, all the colleagues uh, on this forum. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaunda, for setting the scene and your uh, usual insightful and uh, passionate, as well as shocking highlights uh, around uh, the fisheries ecosystem in uh, the region, uh, particularly at the Pan-African level. Uh, uh, your leadership, I think, in building uh, uh, the, the future uh, cadre of researchers uh, across uh, this region is uh, greatly appreciated. So without further ado, allow me to go on to the next speaker. Uh, who will provide us uh, with uh, the big idea. Uh, this is uh, Josie South, uh, who is a lecturer in ecology at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, we have had, uh, you know, very uh, candid discussions with her uh, in, in moving around this agenda, and we appreciate uh, her, her uh, you know, uh, insights. Uh, she is an uh, aquatic ecologist. She works at the interface of uh, uh, global change, natural resources management, and conservation. Our work generally relates to uh, predicting the impacts of our stressors, uh, evasive species, climate change on fish and fisheries across uh, Africa. So over to you, Josie. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in today to be part of this discussion. Um, Professor Kunda has really nicely set the stage regarding wicked problems in African fisheries, which hopefully we're going to be able to discuss a bit more today. Fish and fisheries are intricately linked and intricately woven through African history, culture and livelihoods. Great lakes, floodplains and mighty river systems of the continent hold unique biodiversity, but also provide countless benefits to the community, both near and far from the water bodies. African fisheries share a suite of current and predicted threats to their sustainability and consequently human well-being across numerous sectors. 
Threats can be summarized as broad scale environmental change. This encapsulates climate change, saltation, invasive species, altered flow regime, pollution, many of the things Professor Kwunda has already mentioned. The problem is these disruptors have multifaceted and multidimensional effects on human well being. In this manner, it means that the impacts will cascade through various other sectors. For example, gender disparity, human nutrition, value chains, and the pathways between them. Only through knowledge sharing and collaborative science are we going to be able to upscale capacity, predict and understand and mitigate against the ways these threats may cascade through human livelihoods. Today, we intend to create a network and spark some debate about the subject using lessons and information gathered through various different examples of African Great Lake fisheries. However, all of these learning points can be applied to African fisheries in general. So myself and the other panelists are looking forward to engaging in some out of the box thinking and debate with you all this afternoon. Cheers. Well, thank you very much, Jesse, uh, for uh... Uh, again, coming in uh, to give us uh, that uh, you know big picture, and uh, also again reminding us uh, what uh, we should be focusing on, uh, in including uh, the opportunities uh, for collaboration. Uh, so uh, allow me to move on to invite uh, the moderator, uh, who is uh, Dr. Maxon Ngochera, uh, who is currently the senior deputy director of uh, natural uh, in fisheries in uh, you know his. Uh, you know, in the, in the uh, natural resources and climate change space, um, is an environmental uh, scientist with a specialization on uh, water quality, fisheries, and climate change. Uh, he's a Fulbright uh, Junior Development Fellow and uh, an active member of the Malawi Nyasa Advisory Group. Uh, his present work uh, focuses on uh, monitoring aquatic ecosystems and uh, how they respond to multiple stressors. So we're very delighted to welcome you, Maston, um, as our moderator, more particularly, we welcome uh, the participation of our government. And we trust that, uh, you know, officials from other governments uh, in the region uh, have joined us, uh, including uh, some senior uh, government officials from Malawi, uh, because we're particularly keen uh, in following up on Malawi as well, given uh, the shocking, uh, you know, uh, a picture which uh, Professor Kaunda presented us on Lake Malawi uh, in, in terms of the deple depletion of this uh, very important natural resource, um, you know, the fish is the natural resource uh, in, in the country. Uh, so over to you, um, uh, Dr. Gochera. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are listening from. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Jose, you know, uh, Professor Kaunda and the Professor Nkandawire for setting the scene. Uh, I'm very delighted in the attendance, you know, for this webinar. I wish we had time to introduce each one of you so that, you know, we know what capacity we have. Uh, as we you know, engage in our deliberations. We are very grateful uh, to the previous speakers as uh, they have emphasized that you know, what we have is the human capacity, but perhaps I think we need to start you know, the knowledge sharing that has been very good to me. And uh, uh, this evening or this morning, we have uh, uh, several, speakers as our panelists and uh, they range you know from uh, fisheries as the a nutritional source uh, they also look at uh, gender issues uh, value chain uh, invasive species and uh, environmental uh, change and so without much ado i'd like to introduce our panelists uh, starting from uh, Dr. Victoria Ndolo. Dr. Victoria Ndolo is a teacher by profession and uh, turned into a food scientist. 
She is currently teaching at the University of Malawi uh, at Chancer College. And her research uh, interest is in food processing, mostly looking at the effects of processing uh, on the chemical composition of foods. Uh, this includes nutrients and bioactive compounds with a focus on cereals, fish, fruits, and the vegetables. I welcome you, Dr. Victoria Andolo. Uh, thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Abigail Bennett. Uh, Abigail is an assistant professor of Global Inland Fisheries Con Governance in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. Dr. Bennett is a social scientist with a background in policy studies and human geography. Her work focuses on the contributions of fisheries and aquaculture to livelihoods and food security, including recent research examining food access, livelihoods, and gender in Lake Malawi fisheries value chains. I welcome you, Dr. Abigail Bennett. Our third uh, panelist is Dr. Coletta Gandizanwa. Uh, she holds a PhD in agricultural economics from the University of Pretoria. She is a researcher in and postdoctoral fellow with the Food Systems Research Network for Africa, FSNET Africa, and her research interests are in food systems resilience, value chain analysis, agricultural productivity of smallholder farmers, agricultural investments, and impacts assessment. Coletta has been part of an interinstitutional team of scientists analyzing the land reforms, proactive land acquisition strategy, farms in South Africa. Part of her experience to date includes investment analysis and research project uh, management. I welcome you, Dr. Coletta. Uh, our fourth panelist is Dr. Josie South. She is a lecturer in ecology at the University of Leeds in UK. Uh, Josie is an aquatic ecologist working at the interface of global change, natural resource management, and uh, conservation. Josie's work generally relates to predicting the impacts of stressors, and these include invasive species, climate change on fish and fisheries across Southern Africa. I welcome you, Dr. Josie. Uh, our next panelist is Dr. Zara Pattison. She is a senior lecturer in plant sciences from the University of Stirling in Scotland. Zara's research focuses on the drivers and impacts of invasive plants, particularly in relation to food and water security in East and Southern Africa. Zara's work is also focused on making field-based environmental science safer and more equitable with particular focus on the safety of women working outdoors. I welcome you, Dr. Zara, uh, to this webinar. And finally, our speaker is Professor Frederick Jones Muyodi. He is from the Department of Zoology, Entomology and Fisheries Sciences, Makerere University. He is a professor of water resources management and environmental health with 20 years experience, where he has also served as Dean and the Deputy Principal in the College of Natural Resources, Makerere University. He is currently part of a team studying the feasibility of a real-time water quality management innovation using a combination of ground probe sensor and satellite data in cage farms in Lake Victoria, Uganda. He has researched and taught courses in capture fisheries, aquaculture, uh, limnology, and aquatic environment, water quality management, aquatic microphytes, and emergent species, among others. He has widely published. Welcome uh, to this webinar, Professor Frederick Johnson. Uh, uh, we will give a chance to 
these panelists to speak or to make a presentation. And the, because of the time constraints, I will limit uh, your time to 10 minutes. And then I will invite uh, the audience to make comments or uh, give questions at the end of the presentation. So we'll first of all, have all the uh, six presenters, and then we'll have general discussions at the end. We hope that we can finish this by uh, 4.30 uh, Malawian time, so that this being a Friday, uh, people uh, can start doing other things. Uh, to kickstart our uh, meeting today, I'll invite Dr. Victoria Ndolo uh, to make her presentation. Thank you, and I welcome you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, the organizers for the webinar, and thank you for inviting me to share on uh, fisheries for essential nutrition. Next slide. Okay, so when we look at fish, we realize that fish is a component of uh, the diet for most of the population. And fish can be uh, served in different formats. Uh, we either prepare it to boil it or fry it. It could be eaten as part of a main meal, but fish can also be eaten as a snack. Uh, we therefore see that uh, fish is quite important in terms of the people's uh, nutrition. Next slide. Uh, in my presentation, I want to focus on uh, the essential nutrients that we benefit from fish. When we look at fish, we actually realize that fish is a nature's superfood uh, because we normally just look at fish as a source of protein, but we realize when we do nutrient analysis that uh, fish is also a good source of healthy fats. And I think when we look at healthy fats, I will uh, focus in later on on the omega-3 fatty acids. But fish is also a good and unique source of um, minor micronutrients, uh, such as vitamins. So we look at vitamin D, which is not found in most food sources, but you will find it in fish, uh, similarly B12. And then vitamin A is also a micronutrient that is of importance across the world. And even in Malawi, we talk about vitamin A as among the three micronutrient deficiencies that are of public health concern. And then when we look at fish, we also realize that fish is a good source of minerals. Uh, you talk about iron, iodine, and iron and iodine among the three micronutrient deficiencies of importance that we know across the nations and within the region in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in Malawi. And the, of late, I think we are learning from Malawi that zinc is also becoming a micronutrient uh, of importance because uh, recent studies in Malawi actually showed that uh, across the board, the population of Malawi, they are they are de zinc deficient. So over 60% of the populations across the different age groups like zinc. So we actually see that fish is a really a good source of all the nutrients and not to uh, forget about calcium and uh, selenium. Next slide. So here I just want to highlight uh, the functional roles of the different uh, nutrients. I will not speak to each of the uh, nutrients, but I think I'll highlight the ones that I talked as being of importance and where we look at uh, different micronutrient deficiencies or uh, bigger nutrient deficiencies within uh, Africa, but also in Malawi. So we hear about proteins as uh, being a good uh, fish, being a good source of proteins. So apart from 
fish being a good source of proteins, we learn and we know that proteins in fish are highly digestible, therefore highly bioavailable to contribute uh, to growth. Uh, in particular, we uh, can actually uh, narrow down to look at the essential amino acids, lysine and methionine. And when we look at uh, cereals and legumes, which are a major uh, food in the diets of most Africans, we note that cereals and legumes lack lysine and methionine. But we see these amino acids being present in fish, making the proteins in fish being very unique and particular. <clears throat> and then we also uh, look at uh, the fats in fish, and we look at the different fatty acids that make up the lipids. And one that is of importance is omega-3 fats. And this one is also very essential, uh, especially when it comes to uh, brain development, <coughs> uh, uh, cognitive development, uh, trying to uh, improve the immune system of the body. And uh, these omega-3 fatty acids are mainly found in fish that have high uh, fat content. And you uh, notice that because fish is highly consumed by uh, the rural population and is also one of the uh, source of animal proteins that people can easily access, then we see that fish plays a critical role in providing uh, these particular fats. And then I'll look at uh, vitamin A is also quite essential uh, in growth of the child, uh, also helping to improve the immune system and uh, also helping to improve eye health. So we actually see that uh, fish is not just uh, helping in brain development, but also the eye development contributing to a complete human being who is actually well uh, eating a well-balanced food that will help to improve their health uh, in general. And we learn that uh, fish and fish fish and fish shell shellfish provide about fourteen percent of the world's needs in terms of animal protein, uh, which is uh, quite high, and uh, making it a point that we need to encourage our uh, consumption of fish. And I'll finish by looking at zinc. So in Malawi, as I said, we have issues with zinc deficiency. And therefore we have a solution that we can actually promote. So we can promote use of uh, utilization of fish at household level to start addressing uh, that issue of zinc deficiency. Our next slide. So when we look at fish and its contribution to food and nutrition security, we actually realize that uh, uh, fish is contributing uh, quite a proportion towards uh, the food and nutrition security of the world and in particular Africa. So my interest in that table was to look at how we compare uh, at world level in terms of fish contributing to uh, animal proteins in the diet and how much a person is able to eat uh, per year. So when we look at our world level, food con our fish consumption is at 19.8 kilograms per person per year. And uh, when we look at uh, Africa as a continent, we are getting almost 50% of what is consumed at world level. So I think that's a good indication because uh, 19 and uh, 10, maybe would be saying 20, 20 kilocalories and at Africa level, we are at 10, which will be like 50%. So I think as Africa, in terms of using fish in our diet, we are doing really well. But maybe when we now start looking at particular countries, then we see that there is uh, quite uh, some variation, but we also want to uh, recognize Uganda, which is uh, consuming actually above what is consumed at Africa level. Next slide. So here I wanted us to just uh, appreciate the uh, fish proteins as compared to other uh, animal-based proteins and how we consume them at different uh, levels. 
So here we actually see that when we look at the total protein uh, content that is in our diet, we as Africa, we have a similar trend uh, to the world level. Uh, so this one is just trying to concur with the, what I presented earlier on. We actually see that although we don't seem to consume quite much grams per capita per day, but the trend is actually similar at world level compared to Africa. So generally, when we look at our fish consumption in our diets, it's actually good. And then I also thought we could look at the uh, uh, proteins consumption from fish uh, based on socioeconomic class. Uh, are we seeing differences in terms of the proteins that we are consuming when we compare different uh, social classes? And then we also compare different sources of protein. And when we look at the uh, graph to my right, we see the groupings being poor, middle, and the, the width. I, I think this one is a graph that can encourage us that, yes, although we look at the poor, not really being people that can afford, but when we look at their consumption of fish, we are actually trading in the same range. So if I look at the market fish, the poor are consuming at about 25%. And when I look at the middle class, they are at slightly above 25. So, sorry, slightly below uh, 25. So the poor are even consuming more market fish than the middle class uh, compared to the width, uh, which shows that uh, uh, fish is contributing a lot to the health of the population that is pure, which is a good thing. This is uh, statistics that I took from an article from uh, Kenya, uh, but I'm hoping that we can actually apply it across this, uh, uh, most of the African countries. Next slide. Uh, so this one is a graph that is showing uh, uh, global consumption of fish. And I think I would want to uh, agree with uh, Prof Kaunda that uh, while the graphs are trying to show that we are consuming more fish, but the reserve where we are getting our fish is actually declining. So there is an issue for us to get concerned with. More people are wanting to consume fish, which is a good source of the nutrients that they need for their health but the supply is actually going down. So I think that's an issue that we would want to interrogate. How do we maintain the supply? Because we know the healthy benefits that we get from fish. Next slide. Here is uh, just uh, graphs and map showing consumption patterns of fish species uh, around the world. And I think my interest there was uh, in Africa. So when we compare with North America, South America, uh, Europe, Asia, we actually see that we are the lowest in terms of consuming our fish. Next slide. Uh, so this one is trying to look at the consumption of fish in Malawi. Uh, Max tells me that my time is up. So maybe I'll finish with the, this and one more slide. Uh, so here is actually trying to look at some impact of uh, fish consumption in Malawi. So between 2018 and 2019, we see that there was a decline in the total cash of fish and that also affected the amount of fish that people ate. So we see in 2018, it was 12.63. And then in 2019, it dropped to 8.72 kilograms per person per year. And that's an effect of the drying up of uh, Lake Chirwa. Next slide. <coughs> Next slide, I think I will just talk to the last but one slide. Next slide. Okay, this one, <clears throat> no, the other one, the one before. Okay, so I think this one is the same that I was talking to, maybe trying to interrogate uh, what are the changes that happen when there is a climate change, 
then there is change in the uh, production of the fish and uh, that will affect the amount of fish that people are eating. And at the end of the day, it will affect the nutrients that people have and hence affect the health of the people. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ndolo, uh, for that wonderful presentation, uh, particularly highlighting on the uh, essential or what we can get you know, from the fish, and also highlighting on how the fisheries are benefiting you know, the, uh, the poor, that you know, they are the ones that actually are consuming more fish than anyone else. Uh, I will now invite uh, uh, Dr. Abigail, uh, who is going to present to us on issues of gender uh, and uh, the fisheries of Malawi. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Abigail. Thanks so much, Maxon. Really appreciate it. And um, thanks to Professor Mukundawiri and, and AAP for, for bringing us together and um, and all the other panelists from around the world. This has been really great so far. And um, I think like Josie said, this is a really special conversation because it's bringing together ecologists and, and folks like Victoria Nolo focusing on nutrition and, and social scientists. And um, I think it's gonna be a foundation for us to think about the social and ecological interactions in these systems that are gonna be key for you know for solutions to these wicked problems that um, Prof Koenda mentioned. So I've um, been really excited about this. Thank you. Um, so before I start, I just wanna mention that what I'm gonna present today is um, really not my work. It's bringing together work by um, a large team of collaborators, um, in particular students who have been working on these issues over the over the past few years. So Emma Rice, a master's student here at Emma, MSU, Edith Gandway, a PhD student here at MSU, um, Patrick Jimseu, a, a master's student at uh, Luanar in Malawi, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, faculty and researchers um, from around the world. So it's a pleasure to kind of bring their insights together into this presentation for you. Um, and a lot of this work was funded by AAP, in fact, and so so thanks for the opportunity to, to do some of this work and present it. Um, next slide, please. So we know that women are really important in small-scale fisheries. Um, so globally, 45 million women participate in small-scale fisheries, and four out of 10 people in small-scale fisheries around the world are women, um, and they participate in all stages of fishing and kind of pre-harvesting stages before um, you go out fishing. So um, pulling together gear and food and all the inputs that are required to go out fishing in actual harvesting fishing itself. And, and of course, um, in the post-harvest sector in, in fish processing and trade. Um, and as we know, in the African Great Lakes region, women play an especially important role um, in the post-harvest sector. Um, and you can see a photograph here from a, a fish market in Kotakota in, in Malawi, um, all the women selling fish. Next slide, please. So when we think about gender in fisheries and actually the kind of gendered um, dynamics of environmental change, uh, I think there are many different questions we can ask, but three really important ones that I wanna to highlight today are how does gender mediate experiences and impacts of environmental change? How can environmental change exacerbate existing risk and vulnerability for women? Um, and also what resources, capacities, and networks do women draw on to adapt to environmental change and empower themselves? And, and also what kinds of support do they need to do that? Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll present some, some data and research that we've been doing, and, and I just want to mention briefly the type of data and research that we've been engaging in to address um, some of the questions that I just mentioned. Um, this is a perspective piece that Emma Rice and, and Edith Gondway recently published in um, the American Fisheries Society magazine. Uh, perspectives from fisheries social scientists, mixed methods as a DEIJ tool, as a diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice tool. And so what they point out in this piece, which is really great, is that um, 
is that using combining quantitative and qualitative methods is a really important way to look at issues like gendered and gendered impacts of environmental change. It allows you both to kind of quantify impacts and test hypotheses about what's driving um, gendered impacts, um, but also use qualitative data like interviews and focus groups um, to generate a rich understanding of, of how those impacts are experienced to generate um, hypotheses and kind of understand what's driving them um, and, and to elevate the voices of actors in these systems like women and um, women fish traders. And so this is a this is a nice piece that they wrote and kind of frames up a lot of what we've been doing. Um, next slide, please. So I'll talk just briefly about the um, data that's underpinning some of the results I'll be presenting today. Um, is, like I said, both qualitative and quantitative data that's gender disaggregated. So the quantitative data that uh, we utilized were market surveys um, that we did between October 2019 and January 2020. And this, this field work was led by um, Park Muhanda. Um, and uh, he and his team did interview, uh, surveys with fish traders in 79 markets. Uh, they surveyed 929 participants. So that included about 150 fishers, um, 170 processors and wholesalers. Um, 110 of those were women, 60 were men, um, and 604 retailers. So um, almost 300 women and a bit more than, than 300 men. And so those, those surveys looked at um, market data, so how much was being traded, what species of fish were being traded, what prices, what volumes, um, buying and selling locations to really get a sense of, of the post-harvest sector. Um, looking at two species in, in particular, uh, Chambo and Usipa from Lake Malawi. Next slide, please. So then in addition to that quantitative data, we also collected um, focus group data. Um, Patrick Jimseo and, and our colleagues at Luinar um, were leading these focus groups in January of 2022. Um, and they included uh, more than 200 participants, um, half of those were women, and they did those at 12 different um, markets throughout Malawi. So this quantitative and qualitative um, data about fish trade allowed us to look at some of the um, gender questions that I'll talk about now. Next slide, please. So one thing that it that this data allowed us to do was examine the different roles of of women in the in the fisheries value chains in Lake Malawi. So the maps that you can see here um, are maps of where Usipa uh, on the right and Chambo on the left go after they're harvested. So where are the markets that these fish end up at? And you can see the kind of thickness of the lines is the volume of, of these fish and where they're going. You can see, so Chambo is the fish that um, Prof Konda uh, showed has, has really declined a lot recently. And so you can see there's much less volume of that flowing throughout the country. And then Usipa is, is still quite abundant in the, um, uh, in the fish catch and is, is flowing all over the country. Um, but this data also allowed us to look at kind of some of the, the gender distribution of actors in the post-harvest sector. Um, so we found that 49% of USIPA traders are women, so about half. Um, only 22% of Chambo traders are women, right? So women play different roles in different um, fisheries and the post-harvest sector is associated with them. But we also found geographic differences in women's participation in the value chains. Um, with 61% of USIPA traders in the northern region of the country being women um, and a lower percentage in the, in the central and southern regions, right? And so this kind of gender disaggregated data in, and, and spatial data in the value chain um, allows you to get some resolution on, on the different roles that, that women and men are playing um, in the post harvest sector. Next slide, please. Right, so in addition to kind of what role and, and where are, are women playing these roles in the post-harvest sector, um, we were interested, and, and this is work by Emma Rice um, for her master's thesis, we we're interested in understanding um, how are women benefiting differently from um, participation in the post-harvest sector than men? Um, and so Emma did an analysis um, of marketing margins for men and women USIPA traders um, and she found that women make significantly lower marketing margins 
um, than than men. Um, and so you can see in the in the first column there is is the marketing margins for uh, for women in in um, Malawi and Kwacha for Mulu, which is just the selling unit, the small amount of fish, um, and then in US dollars. So I'm right. Next slide, please. So, you know, given that women are are not performing as well, at least in terms of marketing margins in the in the post-harvest sector, there's of course questions about why and what's driving that and, and what challenges do women particularly face um, in the value chain. And so that's where this focus group data comes in. Um, and Emma used the, this framework, the gendered value chain framework to, um, to kind of look at different dynamics within the value chain and, and how those um, were affected by, by gender and power relations. So she looked at gendered composition, looking at how the tasks and roles of women are different um, in, throughout the value chain. Gendered performance, so how economic benefits are distributed between different groups of people, in this case, men and women in the value chain. Um, gendered governance, so looking at which actors have control and decision-making power um, over, uh, over marketing, over trade, over how decisions are made. Um, and gendered constraints and opportunities. Um, so really understanding what are the challenges, but also opportunities that different types of actors face. Um, in the value chain. Next slide, please. So I don't have time to go through kind of the results across all of those um, different themes, but um, I want to point out just a couple findings that are um, that are instructive. Um, so you know, one finding that came out from focus groups um, with male fish traders um, was that they thought, many of them thought that gender doesn't really matter in terms of performance in the value chain and in terms of economic benefits in the value chain. So um, one man at the Chihuahua market said, there's no difference between male and female traders. We all work hard in ordering and selling to customers. It all depends on the amount of capital and one's hard working at the business. Um, and then women in focus groups had a had kind of different perspective on this issue. So a woman at Limbe market said, Men do better in business normally, just because they have more capital than women. Um, us women also have more responsibilities, right? And so um, even among different actors and men and women, there's different perspectives on, on what the challenges are. And, um, and I'll just kind of highlight the importance of, important role of capital here, right? The men and women agree that, that access to capital is important for performance in the value chain. Um, but women point out that, that their access to capital is, is lower. Next slide, please. So um, these focus groups also uh, reveal different constraints um, that women and men face. Um, so we've mentioned access to formal financial services, um, access to transportation is a constraint for, for both women and men traders. Um, access to storage, right? So a woman at Jetty Market said, sometimes we carry fresh fish going to a far places. Um, so we're asking for a place to store our fish. Um, price volatility is a challenge and creates a lot of risk um, in the market. And then gender-based violence is also, um, also a challenge in the, in the fish trade. So a woman at Jetty Market said, the fishermen sometimes bribe us they want us to be intimate with them in order for them to sell us anything. If we say no, then they do not sell us. And so, you know, these types of insights are really important for thinking about how, what might be the gendered impacts of environmental change, right? So um, if in a context where environmental change is causing increased scarcity of different fish species, um, what are the implications for, you know, um, gender-based violence and, and whether that's going to increase or, de or decrease, right? Price volatility, all of these um, issues interact and respond to um, environmental change. So I need to be wrapping up now um, so we can uh, kind of skip to the, to the end of this um, presentation. Um, I'll, you know, um, be happy to, to revisit some of it and, and answer any questions in the, in the Q&A. But thank you very much for the opportunity to present this. Uh, thank you so much, Abigail, uh, for that wonderful presentation. We'll now move on straight to our next presenter. And uh, 
She is Dr. Coletta, and she'll be talking about value chains in fisheries. Welcome, Dr. Coletta. Thank you very much, Max, and thanks uh, to all the other presenters. Um, I am very excited to be here and uh, presenting uh, on value chains and fisheries in Africa. I am a researcher at FSNet Africa. Uh, FSNet Africa is a um, research ex excellence project that is funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund under the auspices of the African Research Universities Alliance and um, uh, UKRI. Um, the partners are the University of Pretoria, where the project is hosted, and um, the University of Leeds in the UK and uh, Fanapan. Um, so the conversation that we're having today uh, is very crucial. Um, I've been listening to uh, Victoria talk about nutrition and uh, Abigail about gender. Um, and especially in the context of um, the disruptors that we have to the environment. Um, so um, I would like us to step back and uh, think about the concept of value uh, in value chains. So um, we can move on to the next slide. So I think different people uh, define value in different ways. There are different uh, definitions, but um, we mostly uh, divert to financial value because it is easy to, 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 to measure. And if we can put a rand or dollar uh, value to something, then we know what's happening. But uh, I would like us to challenge uh, ourselves to think beyond uh, that single or unidimensional uh, definition of uh, value. Um, maybe the answer to Prof. Kaunda's question uh, initially uh, of how do we constantly face these wicked challenges is I, I hypothesize in the way that we define uh, value. So um, value creation calls for a contextual understanding uh, of, of what is happening in the value chain. So what activities are taking place? Are they primary or support activities? So if there's primary activities, um, they're directly linked to the, uh, uh, to the activity. And if they're support, um, uh, you are looking at, uh, uh, the role of financial services, the government, uh, ETC. So if we are looking at um, the value chain, we also under, want to understand uh, the actors and their functions. Uh, what are they doing? Are they related? Um, do they talk to each other? Do they have the same understanding of, uh, of value? And um, I'll get back to this towards the end. We also look at the constraints and weaknesses, the strengths, what are the opportunities um, for creating value on the value chain? So when we move fish from one stage to another, um, are there opportunities for value creation? And then you see, you begin to see that innovation is very central to this uh, concept of value creation. Can we move on to the next um, uh, slide? So what I'm saying is that financial value is relevant, but is not a sufficient um, a definition of uh, value. So in value chain analysis, it is important to understand uh, what are the actors um, are defining um, values. So if you look at the different stakeholders on the value chain, how do they define value? Is it an issue of social value rather than that financial value that I illustrate on that uh, picture? Is it about the utility? Is it about safety? And if we really get into um, the details of that value definition, we get closer to, 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 to value chain uh, the important role of value chain analysis. And I want to emphasize this because so many African studies have been done uh, on value chain analysis, but then I go back to the challenge that we've been given by Prof. Kawuda today. Why are we still facing the problems, the wicked problems today? So maybe let's look at the definition of um, uh, uh, 
a value in our value chain analysis. So value chain analysis is a very important tool for assessing performance uh, in all aspects. We analyze the value and cost of activities. We also have an opportunity to look at other value chains, what's happening in the beef value chain, what's happening in the tofu value chain. For example, if I want to look at um, 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 uh, substitutes for fish. And then in so doing, we identify opportunities to gain uh, competitive advantage. So now I want to uh, show you the Malawian value chain. If we go to the next slide, just. So this is um, uh, the Malawi fish value chain that I have um, um, adapted from um, Nankwenya et, et al, from some of the work that uh, they've done with Prof Kawunda. And uh, if you can just uh, click until we have all the, yes, all of them, just click them away. I'm not going to stop you from doing that. So if you look at this value chain, um, we see that the primary activities are those that are at the bottom, uh, starting from supply chain uh, all the way to uh, consumption. And at each stage of uh, the value chain, we've got different inputs that are coming at different stages. So uh, we've got uh, at fishing level, we've got the baskets that are used, the lambs um, at processing node, we've got the drying rigs, the uh, firewood that is used for, for processing. If we go to wholesaling, how are we packaging and uh, how are we transporting the, the, the fish? And then we go to, um, um, uh, to retailing and consumption. You can see an opportunity for that gender difference that uh, Abby was talking about at each, at each stage of, of, of this value chain. And you can also see that um, um, there is an opportunity to add value, whether it's nutritional value or to actually deal with the gender dynamics that Abby was uh, uh, referring to in the previous slide. And for different species of fish, you can uh, follow a different uh, sort of um, uh, value chain, it can either be longer or shorter. So if your chambo is not going to be processed, uh, we end up with wholesaling and straight to the consumer, or maybe from the uh, fish, fish, fishmongers themselves straight to consumption. So these uh, value chains differ according to the type of fish that we are looking at, um, uh, and they differ according to what uh, market we are targeting. And if you look at the support uh, activities above, I've referred to that, those are the different actors that you, you can see. And of importance again, um, is in this discussion that we are having now, what are the functions of those support actors, ac academia, um, the different departments that we have, are they talking to each other? Um, and uh, as Prof Kaunda said in his uh, uh, um, presentation, sometimes there are poor linkages um, uh, that are linking research to, 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 to policy. So there needs to be some interaction that takes place between these support services. If we can move to the next slide. So this slide is showing you the, uh, okay, my previous slide was showing you the, the, the business as usual scenario. And then here, I'm not going to talk much about the disruptors, but I just want to show you that picture to, to, to give you a sense of what happens when a, when a disruptor comes onto the value chain. These uh, disruptors have been uh, well-defined in previous um, um, uh, presentations. And all I'm going to say is that um, when these disruptors come, they intensify the problem. So all the non constraints that we, we have on the value chain become mag magnified. Uh, all of a sudden, there are serious problems and um, it, it results in a lack of capacity to really deal uh, with and strengthen the value chain. So let's go to the next slide. Um, again, the constraints, we see the effect of them. We cannot move. There's a lack of a win-win uh, strategy in the overall shape of uh, costs and profits. We saw in uh, Abby's presentation that women get less margins as compared to men. So from a value chain uh, uh, perspective, we can look at uh, this at what stage of, of the fish value chain are our um, uh, margins now starting to differ and why is that? So this is really an opportunity to, to, to look at 
all these different constraints in creating an enabling environment for optimal value addition for the um, uh, 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 value chains. So if we move to the last, last but not least slide, I think it's one before last, uh, it's the important questions that uh, I was posing for us to reflect on. Who are the winners and losers when we look at the value chain. So we have our business as usual scenario, a disruptor comes in and uh, our constraints become very magnified. And then we have questions, uh, who are the winners and losers? But is it possible to have uh, uh, a fair share? Are the margins all going to be the same across the value chain? Is that possible? Or uh, it's a matter of us accepting some trade-offs that need to, to happen. And this, we can really unpack and think about what are the gaps and weaknesses? Um, how can we really strengthen uh, the value chain? So if we look at gender, uh, what are the opportunities for women to really, at each straight stage, sort of uh, add value, whether it's nutritional value to, 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 to the fish? What are the measurable impacts so that we can really monitor and manage the situation? How can these disruptive impacts be managed? What are the levers and targeted action programs to upgrade and improve the value chain performance? In my last slide, I'm just going to emphasize uh, the fact that when there is uh, a negative, you can click, when there is a negative disruption, um, we have to think about these questions that I've asked uh, uh, previously and say, um, what do we need to accept a trade off? What is possible? What is not possible? Um, in dealing with the wicked problems, maybe if we focus on the positive disruption, you can click. How do we make positive uh, disruptions on the uh, value chain? Uh, on the value chain. So this perspective of value chain analysis gives us an opportunity to deliberately look at the positive disruptions. And uh, in multiple di uh, dimensions, how can we support women, for example, to, to, to enable them to add value on the fish value chain? Uh, what other value chain opportunities are they? What other fish products can they add um, uh, fish to the, to the porridge, for example, so that we have another avenue or a, a, a value uh, chain, um, a separate value chain that is adding to strengthening and building a, a resilient uh, food system. So um, in conclusion, I think one of the solutions to the wicked uh, problem lies in how we define value in our value chain analysis analysis. Uh, maybe if we change this and we take a more uh, multidisciplinary approach, it would um, lead us to a solution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Coletta, for keeping uh, to time. Uh, I will now uh, allow uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Josie and uh, Zara. They will be presenting together. Thank you. Hi guys, so invasive species, as we've discussed already, are major multidimensional fisheries disruptors. They're broadly, broadly spread across all African aquatic ecosystems, apart from potentially the Okavango Delta, which seems to currently be free. Next slide, please. However, the numbers of invasive species do continue to rise globally. By 2050, Africa is predicted to have a relative increase of 49% in invasive fish species. Invasive fish are a major issue. They're predicted to have accrued an economic cost of above 30 billion US dollars in the last 40 years. These costs have been spread over damage to a diverse range of sectors, including fisheries and the water industry. There are also major management costs associated with them with respect to removing them from systems or attempting to stop them from traveling through systems. However, notice there are no costs recorded relating to invasive fish in Africa. This is a major data gap for policy recommendations. Next slide, please. The issue with most aquatic invasive species in Africa is that they were initially introduced for economic benefit or food security purposes. Next slide, please. These invasion pathways were usually quite convoluted. This is due to selective breeding programs, which have been undertaken in countries where the species weren't originally native either. 
but in locations where the species was unlikely to establish in the wild and cause negative impacts. Next slide, please. The benefits of invasive species should not be ignored, but the true extent of negative impacts might be subtler to detect. However, they might actually just cascade through the multidimensional aspects of human well-being and natural resources. This is what we've tried to lay out here in a conceptual map of multidimensional disruptions of invasive species throughout all of the other sectors that the speakers have been talking about today. It's these insidious effects and the ramifications on human livelihoods, which might actually outweigh the initial perceived benefits of introduction. Next slide, please. For example, these are just a handful of the hypothetical multidimensional impact pathways, which might materialize if Nile tilapia starts to invade new locations, such as Lake Malawi. You'll see that Nile tilapia is already invasive throughout a handful of other African Great Lakes systems, as well as many river systems. Using comparative science, we might actually be able to predict in advance what would happen in an oncoming invasion. Next, please. There's a similar story for the red claw crayfish. It's currently spreading quite rapidly through the upper and, upper and middle Zambezi system. At the minute, there's no real market for the species in Africa. This is due to processing issues value chain issues, as well as different cultural preferences regarding consumption of them. However, there are very, very real economic losses incurred through damage to artisanal gillnet fishers catch, as well as direct consumption of fish fry. Next, please. Red claw crayfish are likely to reach the Okavango Delta in the next five to 10 years. Lake Malawi is also ultimately at risk through the Shiri tributary connections to the Zambezi in both the middle and the upper Zambezi systems. Next, please. Invasive species establishment and impacts are mediated by other environmental change as well. This could act to antagonistically enhance the impacts or actually reduce the impact. We don't know, and these are the things that need to be modeled. However, we do know that artificial and degraded habitats such as irrigation canals act as super highways for colonization and unimpeded movement between water basins. Similarly, other infrastructure development associated with green hydropower can actually alter environmental flows, which facilitates establishment again for more toler tol tolerable species, which don't mind the slower flowing water. Other increases in things like pollution might start to favor more hardy generalist species. This can all have knock on effects with regards to the invasive species impact, as well as other effects of these stresses and disruptors throughout the different sectors. Next, please. These are a handful of predicted invaders in African systems. However, there's many, many more which aren't currently on our radar. The only way that we're going to be able to deal with this is by having truly predictive and preemptive science. We, and to do that, we need a strong collaborative capacity and knowledge exchange between tra transboundary African fisheries, as well as transboundary watersheds. What we need is an urgent horizon scan across shared water bodies to predict which species are likely to come in and by which pathway before it happens. I'm now gonna move on to let Zara speak about invasive macrophytes. Hi everybody, thanks for having me and um, letting me talk about um, invasive macrophytes. So obviously um, I know that this is a, a webinar on fish and impacts on fish, but I want us to also consider some of the more sort of um, indirect impacts um, uh, environmental uh, impacts as well as uh, species that are impacting fisheries. So one of them um, is invasive plants. We know that they have a big impact on terrestrial systems. They're also used um, um, for economic purposes as well in terrestrial systems, but our aquatic systems are under threat um, from these plants as well. Next slide, please. So we've heard a lot about obviously the cost um, of fish. Um, on fisheries, so invasive fish on fisheries. Uh, next, please. But actually the next biggest group that are having a huge economic impact on um, fisheries are plants. So the Leopsa 
it's a class which includes species like water hyacinth, which many of you will know of, um, water lettuce and um, other species as well. Next slide, please. What I want to bring your attention to is that we do have a lot of research um, on invasive plants and their impacts on other taxa and also environments, but there's a lot less research focused on um, how aquatic invasive plants impact uh, freshwater systems. What we do have is um, a prediction that in the future, next arrow please, uh, the invasion of aquatic plants is going to exponentially exceed those of um, terrestrial based invasive plant species. And this is from a paper that Josie also presented earlier. So it's something that we have to consider um, when we're thinking about um, the impacts on fisheries is again, looking at new species that are coming in because as temperatures are rising, we're getting more um, aquatic plants that are becoming invasive as well. Next slide, please. This is just to show you the extent of what an aquatic plant can do. Um, this is a river in the Eastern Cape. I know that we're focused on lakes, but this one leads to a reservoir. Um, and this is completely covered by water hyacinth. Um, very small gaps of water that you can see in here. This will have obvious environmental impacts. So things that we know have been studied, but not in very much detail, impacts on dissolved oxygen, um, impacts, um, so therefore impacts on water quality, also changes in sedimentation and the loss of other native plant species, which can be really important for fish. So a few studies have been done looking at the impacts on fish in Lake Victoria um, of aquatic invasive plants, but we need to have more research in this area. Next slide, please. What aquatic plants really like is they like bays. So bays and inlets within freshwater systems. So they coalesce and they're moved into those bays and they actually cause um, a loss of movement in the water. Next image. And then what happens is you get this co sort of coagulation of um, an invasive plant algae because of the nutrient deposition um, within the water as well um, from pollution. And we know that um, when we go into our freshwater environments, that there's a disproportionate sort of gender that's using these bays as well. So um, women using for washing, um, and how is that going to have health implications on, on people using these areas as well? So multifaceted um, impacts of invasive plants that are really important for fisheries and a part of the invasive species chain that we really need to consider um, when we're looking at um, helping to improve fisheries in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you again for having me. And this has been an amazing opportunity to meet all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Josie and uh, Zara uh, for uh, that wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, final speaker. And uh, this is uh, Professor Fred. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Moderator. I want to thank, first of all, the, uh, the, uh, the speakers that have given uh, their presentation regarding the issues at hand. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, Lake Victoria. Uh, that is the environmental changes in Lake Victoria. Can you go to the next slide? Yes, I'll just give you a brief introduction about the lake. Uh, it being the second largest lake uh, in the world and the second and actually the largest in East Africa, surrounded by the three East African countries, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. And in the basin, when you look at the basin, we have uh, Burundi and, uh, and Rwanda. It is actually generally a shallow lake uh, with the maximum of about, uh, maximum depth of about 84 meters and the mini depth of about 40 meters. Uh, it is a home for about 40 million people. Uh, who read directly and own directly depend to it uh, in terms of the resources as it provides food, transport, power and income, uh, among other things. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, the Nairo patch, uh, we have the Nairo patch as one of the fish species, as an invasive uh, uh, fish species, which is, was introduced uh, in Lake Victoria in about the 1950s to boost the fishery industry. But then the, its introduction actually has led, uh, led to, uh, first of all, it increased the economic uh, uh, in, income, the income uh, to, the, to the countries uh, and also to the, uh, to the beneficiaries 
the communities around, but again, it also resulted into uh, bad effects as it, it ended up by being uh, a polluter to many of the native fish species. And of course, that one had uh, direct negative uh, impacts, which, for example, led to algal blooms because uh, the native uh, species, the cichlids, which used to feed on the algae, uh, were reduced uh, because of its predatory nature. And therefore, uh, algal, algal blooms started uh, uh, appearing from time to time. The other species, which is very important, is the Nyotrilapia. Uh, this Nyotrilapia actually was also introduced into the lake. The original is having been uh, Oriochromis uh, Stulantus and Vida and the uh, Vidabiris, but of course, uh, with time, because of competition here and there, those ones got, uh, they reduced, and therefore the Nyotrilapia was uh, introduced. But again, this one also had very bad effect on, uh, uh, on the ecosystem because of competition here and there. Next slide. Uh, when it, uh, uh, the, the previous speakers, Jose, have talked about invasive species, and uh, uh, these actually uh, they have been a very big problem in the Lake Victoria Basin. Uh, water hyacinths, especially, it has had all the negative impacts on the water quality, on uh, you know, on the, the various fish species, on the fishing, the activities, and so on. Uh, as the uh, usual, of course, it covers the surface of the waters. And as it covers the surface of the waters, there is very little force sunlight which penetrates, and all those organisms which need uh, the site, like the algae and so on, cannot uh, have access to it. And of course, uh, the dissolved oxygen levels within the waters have reduced so much. So this one uh, uh, certainly affects the effects of the other organisms that are aerobic that depend on the oxygen, and therefore the entire system is disrupted. Then the other weed which we have had is the cariba weed. Uh, the cariba weed, uh, uh, Locus aluvinia molesta, is an invasive alien species, water, water weed, which also has characteristics like those of the water hyacinths. And actually, much of the effect of the water hyacinths are also exhibited by the cariba weed. So we find that there is disruption in the water flows, there is covering of uh, you know, the surfaces of the waters uh, because of the, the nature of the, the leaves, you know, and uh, all those, uh, the life. Below, uh, below the mats, these water mats are, are really affected uh, negatively that uh, uh, the real productivity of the lake is reduced. The fishers, you know, cannot get the fish because of the, these plants. Uh, they cannot throw their, put their nets and uh, therefore the entire system is affected. The fishery is affected uh, negatively. Can we look at the next, go to the next slide. I want to talk, at, uh, talk about the impacts of the environmental degradation and human interface. Uh, here, I'm talking about the unregulated demand for ecosystem services, uh, which has led to uh, factors like, you know, increased fishing pressure. There's a lot of uh, increased fishing pressure in the Lake Victoria Basin. Uh, we have also uh, uh, come out, we have also seen deforestation and wetland encroachment, of course, as many more and more people want to use, want to access the resources. But of course, these resources are finite, and then, uh, of course, they have to to, to reduce. So the, uh, the effects, for example, wetland encroachment is an uh, uh, effect on the pollution, or rather the pollution control. Uh, that natural filtration system by wetland uh, uh, plants uh, is, is now uh, compromised. Eh? Deforestation uh, leading to changes in the weather, changes in the climate around the lake, microclimate, and so on. The invasive plant species due to human introduction have also you know, increased with their negative uh, implications. There is also unregulated uh, terrestrial farming practices. We find uh, unplanned settlements here and there, and then nutrient uh, loading, all these ones being effects which are affecting, which really do affect the ecosystem. We are, the Nairo patch, of course, it has, it boosted uh, income such, but then the effects in the long run, it being a predatory species, uh, so, so, so bad. And of course, the effects of industrialization, we have uh, release of wastes, nutrients, you know, the waste waters from the industries and so on. Uh, uh, and much of these are not, uh, rather, they are not uh, treated. Yeah? They are not treated. Okay, right now, because of measures put in place, there is some uh, serious uh, measures taken whereby industries must have wastewater treatment plant so that they can treat their water before it is released to the, uh, into the streams or into the rivers which uh, lead into the lake. Otherwise, the situation has been bad. And also, these ones have really affected uh, the functioning of the Lake Victoria Basin. Next. Uh, effects of increased human interference on the lake, uh, economically, a lot of dollars are lost uh, because of uh, uh, depletion of the services. 
I mean, the direct uh, services have been affected so much, and therefore we cannot, uh, as beneficiaries, as uh, depending on uh, on the lake, uh, we cannot get as much as uh, to, we used to get, and therefore uh, services are reduced. Then there's, of course, the, that decline in capture fisheries due to the invasive uh, plant species and uh, these other animal species which have come on board, uh, predation taking place, changes in the food ecosystems, and so on. Then there's also increased runoff coming from uh, uh, the basin, uh, coming off, coming from uh, industries, from uh, agricultural activities. Some of the agricultural activities are really not uh, so good, and therefore all these have affected the basin uh, of the lake. Then, uh, uh, of course, uh, input of nutrients has led to uh, frequent algal blooms. Where is have frequent algal blooms? We have oxygen depletion. For example, recently in December of last year, uh, the other year, we had lots of fish kills in Lake Victoria that's surrounding water aquatic environments. These ones we believe could have been a result of maybe a result of uh, a reduction in oxygen levels because of too much nutrients which could have come in at a wrong time and then uh, 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 the oxygen levels uh, got down, uh, reduced so much, and therefore most of the fish uh, uh, got uh, affected uh, and died. Of course, we have these plants, eh? the water hyacinths, the dark weed, uh, which have uh, which increase uh, which increase which increase supported by the nutrient loading, the nutrients coming into the lake. There's also been increase in flooding and rising water levels. You can look at some of these figures down here, these pictures. You know, there was uh, there have always been frequent uh, floods because of uh, uh, these bad practices within the basin. Bad practices, the wetlands have been depleted here and there. You know, so all these ones have contributed to some of these uh, problems which affect uh, uh, the people within the areas and pollution, water pollution, oxygen depletion, algal blooms, and so on. Can you go to the next slide? Next slide. Okay. Uh, because of these problems, there have been some interventions which have been uh, brought up, uh, which have been brought um, by the country states. Uh, when I talk about the East African community, I'm talking about Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. So there are various interventions which have been brought uh, uh, at national levels. Like in the case of Uganda, we have projects, uh, projects and training for other sources of income. Uh, for example, aquaculture uh, in Uganda right now, I think we are talking in uh, East Africa, and uh, we are really trying up because uh, this is one of the measures which has been uh, uh, brought and go that reduce on the pressures on the lake so that people can be, uh, we can have aquaculture, we can have pond culture, we ha can have uh, cage culture, and uh, we are doing everything possible as researchers to make sure that we provide the best uh, working conditions for the farmers to be able to at least to supplement on the, uh, on the fish catches which have gone down. And we're also trying uh, uh, with post-harvest losses uh, uh, to curb on unregulated fishing. Uh, fish, uh, there are those, who are, of course, who come with the, this uh, illegal, uh, illegal fishing gear. And the uh, government has said the ministry responsible for uh, fisheries doing everything possible. We have, uh, 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 we have a unit which at least moves uh, on the lake to make sure that uh, illegal fishing is curbed or is reduced. Then we also have waste treatment facilities for the, from the industries. As I said, uh, uh, industries is now required, but all industries must have uh, uh, waste uh, treatment facilities so that they look at, they treat their wastes, waste waters, uh, before they are discharged into the environment, before they find their way into uh, the lake. I've talked about aquaculture already. Um, uh, before, for example, before a farm is established, there must be an environmental impact assessment study. It's a must that uh, uh, they, this must be done in order to come up with uh, mitigation measures to reduce on the negative impacts uh, that would result uh, if nothing is done. Wetland restoration is now a must. Uh, actually, we have now ha we have uh, uh, some measures in place uh, to restore the wetlands and also control uh, further degradation. Uh, we also have uh, within the Ministry of uh, uh, Water and Environment, we have a unit which is responsible for that. And uh, we are the government is also coming up with measures of maybe compensating those who own wetlands 
because according to our water land land uh, land systems, there are those uh, originally who got titles registration in wetlands for wetlands. Uh, but because of what the uh, the current problems, government has come up with measures to compensate some of those uh, owners or landlords so that the wetlands can now be managed properly uh, to reduce on the negative impacts. Uh, we also have. Uh, uh, diversification of invasive, uh, uh, diversification of uh, uh, invasive plants, uh, whereby some of these plants are being used for uh, as materials for crafts, uh, materials for feeds, mulching, and so on. Of course, this one helps uh, their harvest and put to use. Then we have closed fishing seasons on some lakes or some areas of the lake, uh, whereby uh, when it becomes, you know. Uh, it becomes too much, eh? too much fishing and so on. This affects, uh, usually of, of course, affects uh, uh, the fish stock. So closed, uh, these closed fishing seasons uh, can be uh, put in place and licensing of fishers and boats, marine patrols, as I've already said, uh, for controlling legal fishing and so on. And then aquaculture parks and ecotourism are some of the measures, intervention measures that have been put in place. Um, next slide. I think that should be my last slide. All right, I want to thank you all for having listened to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, let me also thank all the panelists, uh, uh, our guest, uh, Professor Kaunda, who was uh, also let me thank uh, our participants. Uh, you've been a very wonderful audience. I'm still looking at the attendance and we are still okay. Uh, although we are running short of time, I will still give a chance for a few questions. And uh, maybe the first question uh, that is going to Professor Kaunda from the audience is uh, what is the role of the universities in ensuring that inland fisheries remain uh, relevant. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, facilitator. I think uh, the universities have got a big role to generate a lot of knowledge. And this knowledge, uh, we should actually inform policy. What we've seen many times uh, is that there's a disjoint between research and policy and back and forth. So all the policy processes supposed to generate should be evidence-based. And this is a pure you know, university role to generate knowledge. And uh, universities are also supposed to advise um, the private sector, uh, and, and, but especially in sustainable use of the natural resources. So all the processes of modeling, processes of how much to catch, I'm talking about fish uh, and, and, and other, other uh, topical questions that need to be answered by the universities. Um, uh, so yeah, so it's a big role because without knowledge, uh, without this fundamental knowledge, you find that most of the times if there's no knowledge, the policies one, they're not sustainable to the policies themselves, they're actually outdated or they don't even do any meaningful job to our continent. So I think the knowledge generation and, and even scientific breakthroughs is the key uh, uh, what the rest can do. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof, you know, for that eye opener. Uh, indeed, if we collaborate uh, with the government uh, and the universities, academic institutions, perhaps we can achieve more uh, together. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, the next question uh, is going to Dr. Ndolo. And uh, it says, how safe are uh, our fish? Uh, considering that you know, there is increased pollution in our water bodies, and uh, especially with other economic activities like mining, uh, food fraud, uh, preservation, how safe is our, our fish? Thank you. Dr. Ndolo, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, what I would say is that for now, in the absence of uh, a lot of studies being done to actually quantify the contamination of the fish, maybe we wouldn't be saying uh, clearly 
in terms of how safe is our fish. But I think observations and the reports show that when the water is contaminated, the fish is at risk. And I'm sure we've seen uh, reports where water bodies, you have a big group of fish that have been found that are dead. And that's an indication that there was contamination in the water. And uh, ordinarily, under such circumstances, that fish would not be left for human consumption. So the fish that uh, humans are consuming would assume that to some extent it is actually safe. I know that uh, there are some mineral contaminations, but you know, for uh, minerals, we have um, uh, limits of uh, how much is safe to consume that would be found in the fish. So it also depends on the water bodies where you are actually catching this fish and what activities are happening around in terms of contaminating it with most of the mineral elements that are not safe for human consumption. What comes to my mind is lead and maybe mercury that sometimes can actually be found in fish. Uh, thank you so much. And I think this calls for uh, everyone's uh, effort uh, that as we uh, process our, our fish or as we catch our fish, we have to be mindful of the issues of food safety. And uh, I think uh, uh, nations should do, uh, drive you know, towards you know, uh, uh, having you know, a food safety uh, in place. And uh, the next question goes to Professor Richard Nkandawire and is to do uh, with how organizations or institutions can partner with uh, AAP. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much indeed. I mean, uh, we, we work on our partnerships, um, you know, but uh, that partnership has got to be around a well-defined uh, agenda, um, a discipline. Uh, so we would be open to engage uh, uh, organizations further around uh, which areas uh, are, are possible. Uh, so please reach out to us. Um, I'm sure you, you've got our contact and we can have further conversations on how best we might actually uh, partner going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, there was also a question uh, in terms of the issues, you know, happening in Lake Victoria. Uh, and I think, uh, was it last year or two years ago, there was a massive fish kill from cages. Uh, any policies, you know, that would safeguard, uh, you know, the safety of uh, food, you know, within our ecosystems as we develop technologies to enhance our fisheries, you know, in our water bodies. Uh, Professor Fred, please. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, yeah, yeah. In my presentation, I hinted on you know, uh, fish kills as one of the uh, results affecting from problems uh, related to uh, uh, pollution. Yes, we had fish kills, and this one happened at uh, a period when we had lots of rains and there were floods all over. Uh, the water levels rose, uh, the water levels of Lake Victoria rose up, and we find that lots of uh, uh, nutrients uh, were brought in, and uh, some of the aquatic vegetation, vegetation also, much of it sank, the water has since and so on. And this one, uh, we believe, could have uh, led to depletion of oxygen levels, and this depletion of oxygen levels is uh, believed to have been the one uh, which uh, led to the massive fish kills uh, which took place at that time. Studies were conducted. We have uh, uh, the university where I belong and the, the National Fisheries Resources Research Institute uh, uh, conducted studies and uh, uh, it is believed that much, uh, much this, these fish kills were caused by uh, that uh, 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 problem of uh, depleted uh, ox dissolved oxygen levels within the lake. And of, of course, uh, uh, we have organizations. Uh, I want to talk about organizations. I saw, and, and I saw some question there about uh, whether there are uh, measures, regional measures. Yes, we have measure. We have the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization, which is uh, an, an, an agency of the East African community responsible for uh, issues to do with uh, uh, fisheries, uh, issues to do with uh, any problem interventions that to be brought up in the fishery sector and so on. That one coordinates uh, issues of fisheries, 
management, research, and so on in the East African uh, region and also Lake Victoria. We also have projects like the Lake Victoria Environmental Management Project was also a regional project. It has now expired, but it also did a lot uh, to make sure that it coordinates all fisheries activities, including other components on Lake Victoria. Um, we had Vicres is still there. Victoria Research Agency organization is also doing uh, a lot of work on that. So there is a lot of work that is being done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. And uh, I think uh, uh, as scientists, you know, uh, we also have to be very mindful uh, in terms of uh, assessment of where to put, you know, uh, cages and especially maybe on the stocking density. Uh, I will now invite any attendees, you know, if you have any questions, uh, I'll give you the chance to speak. Just raise your hand and then I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Uh, to our platform, so I'll continue to read uh, a few of them. Um, I think uh, there is uh, uh, Sakile Tsotsobe, uh, a consultant in marine resources, and I think he, they, they want to speak to any gender uh, uh, experts. Uh, and I think uh, they have provided their contact addresses. I think they are from South Africa. Thank you so much, uh, Sakiri, uh, for that wonderful uh, observation. Uh, the next question is, uh, we know that Lake Victoria is uh, bordered by three countries. How are these you know, three countries you know, uh, working together to make sure that regressions to fishers and other users are not different as they may bring confusion among users, for example, cross season fishing gears and mesh size. And I guess uh, this goes to Professor Fred. Thank you so much. Yes, I've already uh, uh, hinted on that. Uh, the East African community, uh, which is a regional body, has, uh, has an organization uh, responsible for that, for the fisheries. And this is what is referred to as the Lake Victoria Fisheries organization. The electoral fisheries organization is uh, uh, mandated to look at the issue of fisheries within the Lake Victoria and the other surrounding lakes within around Lake Victoria. It looks at the issues of the, regu the, the regulations, uh, the, the, fishing, uh, the fishing gear, uh, you know, it looks at the issues of uh, uh, who owns, who owns what, you know, uh, in the various countries. It looks at the issues of the kinds of gear that uh, the, the fishers use the boats, the fishing efforts, and so on. And uh, we have, uh, there has usually this Lake Vita Fisheries Organization has uh, uh, joint meetings, joint meetings for uh, the legislators, uh, for the fisheries uh, officers in the three lakes, uh, that is in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, and Uganda, to come up with the best ways of how to manage the fisheries, the fish and the fisheries, and the communities. And also in the community, there are some uh, agencies some bodies uh, right from the grassroots, the fishers themselves, uh, the fish, uh, uh, the, what can the BMUs, uh, the beach management units, uh, these are uh, uh, the bodies at the lower level themselves uh, who, who, uh, who manage this, uh, that aspect of co-management. So they work hand in hand with the fisheries officers to come up with the best ways of how to manage the fisheries to handle issues of uh, pollution, to handle issues of sanitation along uh, uh, along the, 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 the beaches and so on. So uh, that one, the Lake Victoria Fisheries Organization is responsible for that and uh, it is doing well. Uh, we, of course, the academia also participate in some of these, uh, uh, some of these fora. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof, uh, for that wonderful uh, uh, response and feedback. I hope, you know, the other nations can still learn uh, from what the Lake uh, Victoria Authority uh, is doing. Uh, at this point, I think we are now running out of time. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for uh, attending, you know, this uh, webinar. Uh, we hope to have, you know, more of such webinars in future that would stimulate dialogue uh, in terms of uh, how we can uh, sustain you know, our lakes. Uh, I will now uh, request uh, Professor Richard Nkandawire uh, to make uh, his uh, concluding remarks and close uh, the 
um, workshop. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maxon Ngochera, for the moderation. Uh, and indeed, allow me just to thank uh, the uh, keynote uh, speaker as well as uh, the panelists. I think this has been a very exciting dialogue. Um, and from uh, our end, as the Alliance for African Partnership and our partners, uh, would like to uh, take this dialogue to the next level. Um, we're very keen, first of all, in uh, sharing the uh, you know outcomes of this dialogue, uh, maybe through the recording, which uh, has been uh, uh, you know um, uh, done. Uh, and also, we're very keen also following up with uh, a publication, uh, you know, per perspectives. Uh, so we'll be getting back to uh, colleagues uh, to ensure that uh, we come up with, uh, uh, you know, your thought pieces based on uh, the research you have undertaken uh, and share it to the wider, you know, uh, community. Uh, one of the issues which uh, we're very keen in following up on is really around uh, how we reach out to particularly regional economic communities, um, COMESA, SADAC, uh, East African community. Uh, very often we as institutions of higher learning as well as uh, research institutes, uh, we have rather limited conversations at the regional level. Uh, and uh, I would ask uh, Professor Kawunda, who is actually a well-known uh, uh, fisheries uh, scientist in the region, uh, both East Africa as well as uh, Southern Africa, uh, to take leadership uh, in uh, getting that conversation going with our own regional economic communities. From our end as Alliance for African Partnership, we'll be delighted to, to join him. Um, but beyond that, uh, I think uh, we're also keen that uh, each one of us from our respective governments, we explore that opportunity of engaging our governments around uh, these uh, wicked uh, challenges, which uh, Professor Kaunda highlighted. Uh, how do we engage our governments and then move collectively uh, to really address uh, some of those uh, challenges. Um, but beyond that, of course, uh, you know, um, exploring an opportunity for mobilizing resources with the, um, you know, uh, support of uh, our, our governments uh, to mobilize resources that will really respond to some of those uh, challenges, including doing more research, uh, particularly, you know, some of the shocking research that are uh, we can avail to our you know, governments uh, to show that uh, we need urgent intervention um, to, to address uh, the, the, the tragedy that is unfolding uh, within the, the Great Lakes region. Uh, but beyond that, of course, uh, we trust that uh, this conversation will continue, uh, maybe around uh, a, a platform. Uh, we will be talking to our, our colleagues uh, from uh, uh, University of Leeds, Sterling University, University of Pretoria, uh, University of Malawi, uh, you know, the World Fish Center, uh, of course, uh, to uh, the governments in the region, uh, including uh, uh, our own government here in Malawi, uh, to explore if uh, we can actually establish a platform that uh, sustains these uh, discussions. Uh, so we're extremely grateful to everybody. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, joining us, uh, who joined us in uh, this dialogue, would like to uh, open, you know, to, to, to have an open invitation uh, to reach us if you have any questions and uh, we're keen in engaging you further. Uh, we're very delighted that uh, you joined us and uh, we look forward to further interaction with all of you. Much appreciated for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you.